things that uh, you want to ask. So if you don't want them recorded, don't ask the question just now, ask when the recording's finished. OK, so I think we're recording now. Yep. So the recording's on and it's transcribed. As you know, I have a, uploaded these to YouTube and that's simply to make it easier. You can get access to them via Teams, but I know some people find that uh, clunky. So if you haven't yet found it, oops, you haven't yet found it, uh, the YouTube channel is linked from New Materials. And if you haven't yet found them, the material. Uh, now my computer's, now my camera's stopping. Um, so in the module materials, you will find, as he waits for it to load properly, be quick, I'm doing it on this one, wouldn't I? In the module materials, you'll find both recordings. So there's last week's lecture recording and also a link to the YouTube channel is there. And I've been recording these for a couple of years, so you can watch last year's if you think that may help. And if that has managed to load in the background, you'll also find links to that on Teams. So there's a direct link to the YouTube channel on Teams. So you can get access to them anywhere, and I'll do the same. Like you. Um, once again, we are following the syllabus. So hopefully you're keeping an eye on the syllabus and what we're doing. And the syllabus is pretty much, no, the syllabus is uh, reflected in the OneNote chapters that we have here. So we're just going through it chapter at a time. Occasionally they're small chapters, so we do a couple in a week, but you can see which chapter we're doing and what date it is. And I know that I said this last week, but I'm saying it again because I know that some people are new to the class who only just managed to enroll. So you can find all this stuff here, which tells you that this is the week of the 19th. I know this is the 23rd, but I do it from the start of the week. So Monday was the 19th. So in the week of the 19th, we are doing system structures, which is chapter two. But we are not doing all the all of chapter two from the book. We are excluding these sections. So now that you've got your book, you have got your book, haven't you? It's been a week. I'm sure you've ordered it and it's come in. Good, I'm getting some notes. You know which sections we're not covering. But it should be fairly clear anyway. So as usual, we have sections for all the chapters, and it'll depend how your one notes laid out. Sometimes the sections are along the top, sometimes they're down the side. I've got them on both just so that I can show you that sometimes at the top and sometimes at the side. And then you'll have lists of pages, sometimes that are left, sometimes that are right. I'm sure you'll figure it out, you know, second year computing students. So all the stuff is here uh, for the presentations. And actually, once we've done the presentation, I want to talk specifically about uh, some other stuff that I want you to do in the tutorial today. So let's get started, first of all, with today's presentation. So today's chapter two. And it's about system structures. So we're going to cover again quite a lot in this. And again, for them who missed it last week, um, we have two versions of the presentations on OneNote. One is the original set. But as I've just said, we don't do some of the sections. I've cut down the amount that we do. So I've also cut down the presentation. So there's our version. So this is the stuff you need to know. This is the stuff that I'll assess you on. But hopefully you're interested in general, so you can go and look at the other stuff as well. So what we are going to do is have a look at all these things 
and try and understand how an operating system works in general. Because remember what we said last week, the operating system sits between the meat that's working it and the hardware underneath. Usually to allow the people that are using it to do something. And we might, as you're doing just now, because you're on Teams, and I know that there's no command line interface for Teams, you've got a graphical user interface. So it's got a mouse moving about. I can click buttons which make things happen. There's a button there that goes back. I can click a key and it goes forward. So I've got graphics and I've got a mouse and I've got menus and buttons and all that kind of stuff. Alternatively, we might have a command line interface. Anybody who's not played with it should look up something called command prompt. And I'm, I'm just going to assume that you're all on Windows just now. I know you're not. There are similar things for other operating systems. But if you're on Windows, feel free to go and have a play with the Windows command prompt, where I can type in commands like DIR, which gives me a list of the files in that directory. Depending on what operating system you have, though, it's different. Uh, commands. Some of you are doing Unix, so we'll know the LS. That's not recognized in Windows, and it gets upset and tells me that's the wrong command. And that's one of the issues we have with command line interfaces. They are very fast, and once you know how to use them, they're great, but you need to learn them. Graphical interfaces are easy to to pick up and use, but take a lot of the system's resources. So that's a choice that's quite often made. In fact, sometimes you'll see, um, if you walk into a network center, you'll see the people that run the network sitting with a, a graphical user interface on their machine. But what it's doing is running a whole bunch of command line interfaces into the boxes that they are running. Because remember, when we're talking about an operating system, I don't know about you, but my mind says, oh, Windows or, or Mac or whatever. But an operating system can be anything. It can be a phone. It can be a car. It can be a network switch. That has its own operating system in there as well. So quite often we will have links into those to allow us to do things. And the batch interface, eh, the command line interface, gives us a, a quick but difficult to understand we in. We also have a differentiation between things that happen right now. I press a button, my slide changes. And things that happen under what we call a batch system. So things are scheduled to happen. So if you are the Bank of Scotland and you have to run all your Bank of Scotland transactions for Asda and Tesco and Sainsbury's and all the other supermarkets. You've got the choice. You either run them during the day when everyone else is using the computer or you wait till overnight and you run them all as a batch. So you run a job that says run all the Tesco transactions, run all the Asda transactions, run all the whatever it is. And they tend to do that. And quite often you'll see if you have online banking that things happen overnight and that's why they do these things overnight when the computer system is otherwise quieter. So they make use of those resources. So we run things, there's a user interface to run things, that runs a program. And usually that means that we need to interface with the program itself. We have input and output. My input is this mouse and pointer to click this button. And the output is a different display. So I have done some input to create some output. Internally, there's been some processing done. Stuff has happened. We've got a whole queen of other things that happen or that the operating system provides to happen. So file system, you don't want every program having to figure out how to open a file or save a file. So the operating system does that and it provides ways of doing that. 
and it provides ways to organise it. And it provides ways to not care whether you're saving it to a hard disk or an SSD or a USB, it just is safe. We also need to be able to communicate between different things. If you're copying from a USB drive to a hard disk, you need to communicate from one machine to another. You might also need to communicate from one program to another. When I was showing you the syllabus earlier on one note, that's an embedded Excel file. So one note is talking to Excel to show that Excel spreadsheet within one note so the programs have to communicate. And the operating system will provide facilities to do that. Not all operating systems. It will depend on the purpose of the operating system. On the other hand, all operating systems will provide error detection. Any of you that did programming last year will know things like divide by zero. Divide by zero is impossible. So the operating system will catch things like that and say you're trying to do something that's not allowed. Stop it. Sometimes it goes so far and the, and the error is so bad that the machine just stops. And some of you will have seen a blue screen of death, I'm quite sure. If you haven't seen a blue screen of death, With a nice wee video about places that it occurs. Operating system will also decide who gets resources. If you're running Word and Excel and you want to print them both or print from them both, the operating system has to decide who goes in first. There's no point in Word printing a line and Excel printing a line, Word printing a line and Excel printing a line. You want the Word document, then you want the Excel document. So at some point, the operating system has to say, OK, Excel, hang on, I've given the printer to Word so that it prints it. And then when Word's done with it, it lets the operating system know and it says, right, OK, Excel, your turn now. And it does that for all the facilities that we have in the computer, whether it's the amount of CPU time, and again, if you haven't explored it, and do things like run Task Manager. And again, that's a Windows thing. If you haven't come across Task Manager, it uh, shows you all the processes that are running on your system. And there's all the processes that are running on mine. Now, what am I running? I'm running Teams, I'm running PowerPoint, and I'm running OneNote, and I'm running Firefox. But I have a lot more processes running. I've got all of these processes all running in the background, all doing things. My process for running audio is running in the background. I've got a C++ application development process running. Why? because Teams was written in C++, so that's a support package for it that runs in the background. Not surprisingly, I've got Microsoft Office running there. I've got my antivirus running in the background. I have got a whole bunch of things, all to give me the four programs that I'm actually running. So no wonder my CPU is getting upset. No wonder my memory is maxing out. I've got so much stuff happening here. And it's up to the operating system to divide that up. It's up to the operating system to decide how much CPU time you get, how much memory you're allowed. Uh, whether you get file storage, and you'll know if you have, for example, your student account, it has a finite amount of space. And if you go above that, you don't get to store files anymore. The operating system sorts that out. That's called accounting. Not allowing you to use more resources of the computer than you're allowed. So that's an easy one. You're not allowed to store more files, you're not allowed more storage than you, you were allocated. But for other systems, say a big banking system again, there might be other accounting done. So they might count the number of CPU cycles that you use so that if HR run a program or accounts run a program or dispatch run a program or whoever it is, 
they can charge back all these programs to the different departments in the same way as they might charge back hiring a room. You'll charge back hiring the computer to run your software. The operating system will also do all your protection and security. You're only in here because you managed to log in with your name and your password. So all the stuff is controlled. And now that you are all logged in, I can't see your files and you can't see my files unless I explicitly give you access. So I've got lots and lots of files on my OneDrive that you can't see. But I've also got a massive OneNote document on my OneDrive that you can see because I've given you a link. And you can just about see there that this is on Tony's OneDrive. So that's shared space that I have access to all of it, but you've only got access to bits of it. So the operating system does the protection and the security. So there's a lot going on in the background. Sometimes when your computer stops, you think, oh, I'm not doing anything. Well, just think of all the stuff that your operating system is having to cope with in the background. It's part of the reason we give you this course, because sometimes we kind of think of what we are doing as just what we are doing, but we're doing that within an environment where other things are going on or where processes have been put in place to support what you want to do. And it's important to understand what they are and how it affects what you're doing. So in the end, we end up with something like this. So that's from top to bottom. So um, I've got a wee spinning wheel. Too many processes running in the background. There we go. I'm back. Um, so we've got a, an operating system and we are right here. We have access to our own user stuff. And we get to that by using a GUI or a command line or by setting up a batch file to run it some other place. So there are all the user interfaces that we have. And those user interfaces will call functions of the operating system to run a program, to get a file, to send something to another computer to grab some uh, hard drive space. To remember how much hard drive space you've taken and make sure you've not taken too much. So all of these other things fit together as part of the operating system. So that's the stuff in blue. And at no point at all will we get access to the underlying hardware. Can you tell that's a microchip? My drawing skills are immense, as you can see. Okay, so we don't get access to this. It has, thank you for the thumbs up, I'm much appreciated. Um, we don't get access to that. We have to get access to that via the operating system so that it can do all of these things that we just spoke about. So we've got different ones, command line interpreters. I just showed you one example of. Um, you type in a command, it executes. Sometimes it's a command for the operating system. So DIR was built into the operating system to give you a list of files. But I could have run a program at that point. I could have, this will be the point where it doesn't work. I could have typed in Python. And there's me in my Python interpreter. Where I can run Python commands. And have them run on the command line. 
So the stuff that we type in can be operating system commands, or it can be other programs that have been written and made available. And depending on what kind of system you have, you'll see a different type of command. In fact, Unix has the option of which command line interpreter to use. So there's SH for the shell. There's BASH or BASH for the born again shell. There are oh, literally too many to, to name because one of the things that you can do with something like Unix is write yourself a, a command line interface and run it so that it has the things that you like. Here we're looking at the born again shell written by a guy called Born who liked his wee puns. It's born again, do you get it? It's a new shell. Oh, oh, had them rolling in the aisles, it did. Um, and you can see that you can run commands. And these are the commands here. So there's a command line, name of the computer, and then you run a command. The W says what's happening. IO stat, what's happening with the input output. There's that LS that I spoke about before, giving you the list of files and directories. There's pass, uh, print working directory, which gives you where you are. You can ping other computers. So there's lots of things you can do from a command line. I'm not going to spend too long in a graphical user interface because I think you all know pretty much um, how to use one of those and what the features are. The one thing I'll remind you is what happens if it's in blue? Then the assessment. Potentially accessible, yes. So it's the sort of stuff you definitely want to remember. Who's complaining about my 19 Firefox tabs? That's called preparation, Morris. I've got all these things ready to go. Um, you didn't know you could run Python from the command line interface. What idiot taught you Python? That's what I want to know. I never told you that. Yeah. So we have um, different command lines, but we've also got different flavors for different command lines and similar, similarly different flavors for graphical interfaces. So Windows looks different to Mac OS. Oh, and by the way, Mac OS, Unix, despite what they think, it's just a nice Mac graphical interface on a Unix subsystem. Similarly, things like um, Android take bits from Unix, as does iOS. iOS uses icons, but instead of using your mouse and buttons, you just poke. Or if you're like my mother-in-law, you poke to make things work. So you'll see similarities and differences. If you're used to Windows, the Mac OS line is at the top rather than the bottom. They are slightly different buttons and they're at the top left instead of the top right. Stuff like that. OK, everyone happy so far? The tab shouldn't slow it down because it does, uh, it is supposed to put them to sleep in the background so they don't use system resources, but I'm not convinced that they do. Right, so how does all this happen? How, how do we get a mouse pointer on the screen? How do we get PowerPoint to understand that when I click the mouse button, I want to do something? Well, operating systems are something called an API, an application program interface. So if we want a mouse pointer, we say give us a mouse. If we want the mouse pointer to be a red dot with a big yellow background on it so you can see it easily, we can program that. If you want the red dot to get big when I click the button so you can see it's been clicked, you can do that too. 
And if you want certain things to happen when you click a button, like move around within the slides, you can say, OK, if you hit a particular part of the screen, trigger an action. All of these happen with system calls. Now, for the next wee bit, there's a lot of programming stuff in here, and I don't want you to get worried about it. You won't be assessed on the programming stuff. OK, it's just to give you an idea of what's happening um, under the hood. OK. But it's, I won't be expecting you to write um, a new operating system or be calling the operating system around. We'll stick to the LMC and the very simple LMC for that. So I want to give you an idea of how they do it, but I'm not going to ask you to do it. And if you're not following the, the programming stuff, because I know that there's people in this class from different programs where you might not have taken programming as part of it. If you're not following it, don't worry about it. I'm just trying to give you the background and it's not about programming. So the application program interface has a whole bunch of system calls. So if we want to copy a file, so if you've got, if you've got Word save as, in essence, that's copy a file. So if you've got Fred.txt and you want to rename it, you're copying Fred.txt to Barney.txt, or you're copying Fred.txt to a copy of it and renaming it Barney.txt. And there is a system call for that that says, take the source file, Fred.txt, and copy it to the destination file, Barney.txt. And you can see there's a whole bunch of things that have to happen for that to work. What's the name of the input? What's the name of the output? Go through it until you've gone through all of this, all of the uh, data in that file. And if you're writing these things, then you'll become familiar with this kind of stuff. This is how you read a file in a program. Program. I genuinely cannot speak this morning. It's ridiculous in a programming language called C. So first of all, it returns something, but the function is called read. So this is not surprisingly reading a file. And we say, what's the FD? What does FD mean? Oh, the file descriptor. Void asterisk buff. Oh, a buffer where data is read into. OK. Size T count. Maximum number of bytes to be read into the buffer. OK, so go and read it. Go and read this and read a thousand bytes at a time or whatever it's going to be. So we might not read all of a five megabyte file. We might read it in 1K chunks. So we might say read my file into the buffer size 1024. And we take one kilobyte at a time. So if you have to interface and if you have to create programs at a low level, that's the sort of thing you have to understand. And there's whole manuals for that, either online or on paper. And when you call that command, the operating system will run an internal uh, piece of code to make that happen. So if you've got a file copy, that's written into the, the operating system. So someone has written that code to happen, and all you're doing is calling it. And if you have done programming, if you think of calling a function, it's exactly like that. The difference is someone else has written the function and it's running in the operating system. So the user will say open, that will go to the system interface, and then that will happen down at the low level for that to happen and go back and make it available to the user application. Again, if that's not your thing, don't worry about it. As I pointed out in the example, you probably have to tell it some things. You don't just say open a file, you open thread.txt, or you open uh, d colon thread.txt, so you tell it which device it's going to be on, or you know anything at all like that. You might want to open it in text mode or open it in data mode. And even if you don't know that you're doing that, some operating systems will take care of that for you. So, for example, if you open the file thread.txt, 
Windows will more than likely have an association that says any file that ends in .txt is a text file, and I'm going to have a particular program that I will use to open that. Notepad. But if you open a different type of file, if you open an MP4 file, for example, on my computer, that's associated with the films and TV application, and it runs that video. So depending on which file you have, it will open it in different modes. It might be text mode, it might be a data mode, a video, a graphic, or it might be an executable mode. It might be a program that you're opening to run. I have completely lost my mouse pointer. There we go. OK, so we will pass parameters, whether that's the name or whatever, to make something happen. And there's all sorts of system calls that you could have. And one of the things you'll have to be careful of is, is the nomenclature. So we talk about running a program. I run the program. PowerPoint, I run the program Teams. But actually, as far as the operating system is concerned, that's a process. It's something that's running on the system. And you saw when I opened up Task Manager, there was a whole bunch of other processes running, things to facilitate that, things to run the speakers, things to run the displays. All of those help in running all the other things that you're doing. So, we can start and stop processes. We can wait for things. So at the moment I've started a process called PowerPoint. It's created an output of this slide. And it's not doing anything else. What's it doing? It's waiting. It's waiting for me to press a button. And move to the next slide. So there's all sorts of system calls for file management, for device management. You see in that device management, it says request and release. That's the thing that I was talking about earlier, like with the printer. If you want to print a document, you request the printer, you print a document, and then you release the printer because there's no point in anyone else having it. But the same thing happens with all your other devices. Only one thing can use them at one time. So you request the mouse, you request the keyboard, you request the screen to update it. And all these things happen with the operating system sorting out who's getting access to what for how long. There's also general maintenance things. What's the time? What are the attributes of a file? And if you haven't come across file attributes, This is why my computer is so slow. I've got all these things running in the background to be able to show you things. On Windows, it's not called attributes, it's called properties. And it says things like it's an MP4 file and it opens with films and TV and it's got its name and it says how big it is and when it was created. And you can decide whether you're going to have it read only so that you can't edit it. I can give access to other people. Now, this is a Windows machine, so it's... Um, in the main single user, but more people could log in. So at the moment, it's, it's only me, so I've got all the system rights and my rights and administrator's rights, and I can do everything with it. I've got full control of this file. I can modify it, read it, execute it, delete it, whatever. The operating system stores all those properties and gives me access to them. It also allows communications, and I spoke of that earlier, if you're talking from one process to another, but it's also about um, connecting different devices on the computer itself, connecting the PowerPoint program with the PowerPoint file that are both held in memory, and whenever I move between each PowerPoint file, 
the PowerPoint program looks to the PowerPoint file and loads in the next chunk, specifically the next slide. So when I press the button, memory is accessed from the PowerPoint program to the PowerPoint data, and it loads in the next slide. All the stuff I was talking about earlier, but when you get access, that's also the operating system as well. Remember, when you log into your university account, you're logging into an operating system, specifically a server style operating system. And that gives you access to things. So all that stuff that was there, where I showed you there was multiple accesses for um, me, for the system administrator and all that kind of stuff, can be extended to you guys, for example. So there's all of these sort of things. They exist in most operating systems, not all. There's very few, there are very few calls for the operating system for the ABS in your car to open a file. So that's not there. But most things, you'll see similar things. So for Windows, there's an API for create a process. And for Unix, it's called fork. Which means it splits one process into another to create another. Read file for Windows and read in Unix. So there are similar things happening in all these operating systems. Which means that we can write programs to do things. So I showed you that program. In my case, I was using Python to print out Hello OS class. What that had to do, and the example here is instead in <clears throat> C. When I said print, C mute says printf, but it still had to go to the library. I had to get a write system call, in other words, write to the screen. That then came back and displayed it on the screen. So all of these things have to work together. That makes sense to everybody? Thank you, Alan. Right. So just some examples. So there's, there's different types of operating system. I said earlier that I was running Windows, which to all intents and purposes is single user, even though we can set up multiple user profiles. Uh, very much a single user is something called MS-DOS. Some of you may have heard of it. It was the first PC operating system. Well, it wasn't the first, but it was the first popular one. It's something called single tasking. So I keep saying it, I've got PowerPoint running, I've got Teams running, I've got multiple things running. Single tasking means you only get one. So you've got single tasking and multitasking. DOS was single tasking, you do one thing at one time. Windows is multitasking, you can do lots of things. You also get single user and multi user, which work exactly as you'd expect. You can either have one user or multiple users. When a computer boots up with MS DOS, and just so that you know, this is the memory map. So this is zero at the bottom of memory up to high. And I've deliberately put high rather than putting a number because I don't know how much memory is in this computer. Seems I don't know how much memory is in my Windows machine or your Windows machine, but I do know that it starts at memory address zero. So when MS-DOS starts up, it loads the kernel. So that's the kernel of the operating system to get everything working. The kernel then loads a command interpreter. And the command interpreter for MS-DOS looks exactly like that. It has a display, you type in commands and things happen. That's just the way DOS looked way back when. If I type in a command, then it runs that process and that process gets loaded into memory and it's running. And at the moment, what I've got is Python. So I can't type this DIR command again. 
because that's for the operating system. I can only type in commands that make sense for the program that I'm running, which in this case is Python. But once I've finished with this program and I exit, Why did none of my introduction to programming students remind me that I needed brackets? I can exit that program and go back to the operating system command interpreter. So we ran the operating system, we ran the command interpreter, I typed in the word Python, Oops. I typed in the word Python at the command interpreter. That then ran the process, loaded it into memory, and that process then just ran on a loop until I exited, at which point that piece of memory was removed. And we go back to this state again where it's a command interpreter and I can type in another command. Now I'm saying that like the commands DIR and Python are different. They're not. It just so happens that the command DIR is built in. That also, if I type in DIR, that also runs a process that runs a DIR command that prints off the list of files and then automatically exits. So that's the only difference really. DIR automatically exited Python. I had to tell it to exit. So it can only, it's got a single memory space. It can only run one thing at a time and you have to load that program, run it. And then when you want to load something else, you have to exit, go back to the shell to run a new one. Other things like Unix will run lots of processes at once. And here you can see the same kind of idea. So we've got low memory at zero, all the way up to high memory. We still have the kernel loaded in at the beginning. But rather than as it was before, where the first thing it was installed was a command interpreter, that interpreter can be anywhere in memory. We don't care, and it's one of the things that we'll talk about later, how we make sure that things can load anywhere. So we can have lots of processes scattered about memory all running at once. So it's multi tasking. But the same principle applies. You run each process until it's done, then you exit it. Just let me click in the big red X in Windows. So you have your programs, but you also have system programs. Programs like DIR to show list of files. So there's a whole pile of things that you can run. This is going to run. So ping is a network command that sends a packet of data to another computer on the network. In this case, I've pinged bbc.co.uk. I pinged it with 32 bytes of data, and it's telling me that it takes an average of 19 milliseconds to go from my computer to the BBC and back. Some of you are gamers will understand this ping rate perfectly because that's how quickly you can get a command. And if your ping rate's too low, you'll be shot before you can shoot somebody else in some of these online games. But more importantly for what we're doing, it gives us an idea that we can run other programs. So I've run DIR, I've run Python, I've run ping. Sorry, IP stats. And this is the thing when I said earlier about command line interfaces, they're good when you remember them. I've just typed in a, a Unix command, but I'm on a DOS machine. So I get confused as well. So there's all sorts of system programs, and that will depend on the operating system that you're running, what you have available. But again, just like with the 
uh, API calls. There are similar things for some of our operating systems, most operating systems like open files, save files, uh, print files. Most operating systems also have text editors built in or programming languages. Not so much anymore because um, we tend not to use command lines, so we tend to use a, a whole other thing. I had to install Python to make that happen. But there's a whole bunch of system programs and it will depend on the operating system, depending what you need to do, depending whether you want a command line or a mouse or whether you're touching things with your fingers. So we have all these things in the operating system. They're all working away and your heads are all swimming. So. Can I suggest that I use one of my multiple tabs? To start my countdown timer and you take five minutes just to get up and walk around and then we'll come back and look at the operating system structure. OK, and I'll see you back here in five. OK, Google set four minute timer.
Okay, so we're back. Anybody thought of any questions while we had a break? No. Okay, so I want to end by talking about structures of the operating system. So we've got lots of things going on, clearly. Clearly lots of stuff happening with what we are doing. Um, so let's look at some of the structures that we might have in an operating system. So we've got symptoms like DOS. Um, we have things called device drivers. So a device driver is to allow us to talk to specific types of hardware. We may have a device driver for a keyboard or a display. We need the keyboard and the display before we even start doing what we want to do. So they are stored in the ROM. So they are part of the core system. But once we start running, we might have other things that we want to do, like run a printer. Now, there's lots of different types of printers and lots of ways that they could work. So we can't store them all in a device driver. So we have an MS-DOS device driver. Programs will contact these things to contact uh, devices, keyboard, hard disk, whatever. Uh, and the application program can either go through DOS, but actually MS-DOS has access to the core device drivers that are stored as part of the BIOS. Problem with that is, we don't have that separation anymore. We don't have that thing that was in that slide many, many slides ago, where we said that we don't get access to hardware. I know it's here somewhere. So I've said that we're out there, hardware's down there, and we don't get a chance to do it. MS-DOS does not enforce that. So it can cause problems. The fact that we can get access to the hardware is not a good idea. So that's a really simple structure for DOS. Unix is not simple at all. Um, what it does is it loads something called a kernel. A kernel is the smallest, most protected part of the operating system. So it's, it's a spider at the center of the web controlling everything else. So you say to the kernel, I want to open a file. And the kernel will call the file opening bit of software. Or you say to the kernel, I want to print a file. And the kernel will call the file printing bit of the software. So it provides a whole bunch of other functions. So we start a program which calls the system calls, it can do all of these things. Get memory, get a keyboard, get a key in from the keyboard. And that then talks to the memory. Excuse me, that then talks to the hardware. Memory is part of that. So we never get access. So we've got this um, barrier between us and the hardware again, which is far better. Now, the way that it's shown there is OK, but it's not great. I actually prefer to think of the operating system this way. So the hardware is right in the middle, it's protected. And you have different layers outside. So say, for example, you want to open a file. So you're out here opening a file. So you need to talk, first of all, to your command line interface or your GUI, which calls the file opening system. Now, remember, this is just an example. Different operating systems are set up in different ways. They'll have different layers. They'll work in different ways. This is an example. I'll call the file system, which will call the I.O. system to go retrieve that file 
from hardware. When it does, that will then send it back out to layers again. So the file I/O will send it back to memory, which sends a signal to the file system that it's in memory and available to use with all its information, which then sends another message back to the user interface saying the file's ready, which lets you know at the end. So it works its way through the layers and then works its way back, but each one is protected to stop you getting it. Depending on how much stuff you want in that kernel, we can talk about kernels or we can talk about micro kernels. Basically, we're just trying to make the kernel as, as small as possible. The idea being that anything that um, isn't core to that should be hived off to other things. So if we've got file systems or uh, print systems or IO systems, why would we have them in the kernel? Let's take as much out of the kernel as we can and put it elsewhere. And we call that a micro kernel. And Mac OS 10 uses a micro kernel in that way. So it puts as little as possible in that central bit and hives everything off. And that makes it easier to add in new things. However, there is a detriment. All of that stuff where we're working our way through the layers and you talk to the user interface that talks to the file system, that talks to the IO system, that talks to memory, that talks back to the file system, that talks back to the user interface that talks to you. Well, there's overhead in that. So the, we said before that operating systems have communications. That communication isn't free. So that can potentially slow it down, but it does make the operating system much more secure. So it depends how you want to approach it. There wouldn't make much sense to approach, and I keep coming back to it, the operating system for a car's um, anti-skid brakes. There wouldn't be much point in having everything separated out for that, simply because of the way it works. The overhead would be too much. So you don't do it that way. So a microkernel works like that. You have kernel mode where you have all of these things in there for communications and memory management and scheduling and all that kind of thing. They then talk to things that happen at the user mode, whether that's for applications or files or device drivers. And if you have new things happening or you have extra hardware or you want to add extra functionality into your system, you can have loadable modules. So you can add extra things in there, which is great if you want to add extra functionality. And in fact, as I said before, the, the Mac graphical interface is just one of those modules loaded onto all the other things just to make the Mac look like the Mac. And lots of operating systems take that approach to allow you to have extra stuff that you load in. It helps in other ways as well because I keep saying that we get different types of operating system. They are there to solve different problems and to cope with different workloads. If you've got a system and all it's doing is taking the um, ASDA transactions for the Bank of Scotland, why would you have anything built into that operating system to run a printer? All it's doing is taking data and applying it to a, to a file somewhere else. So you need your file system. But why do you need a printer system? In fact, why do you need a graphical user interface or a command line interface come to that? Get rid of all those extraneous modules and just have what you need. So you load in what you have, and it means that the operating system can be as lean as possible. But with the flexibility to add in other things. So other operating systems take that approach. Solaris is another Unix-based system that does the same sort of thing. Um, 
But because there are pros and cons, and you'll hear me say this a lot during this module, there are pros and cons to all of these things. Some operating systems take this hybrid approach. So we want high performance, but we want flexibility. So operating systems like Windows and Mac build that in. They have chunks of it. So Windows has a huge chunk of stuff that's built into its kernel, um, but then has the opportunity to change that with different views or different whatever. Mac is also hybrid, and you have the option of how, of what sort of things that you're going to load in. So you have input output and you have kernel in there, which is called Mark for the iOS. Anyone know what BSD stands for? No free base or something like that, is it? Uh, not exactly. Offer distribution or something to offer distribution. Berkeley or Barkley. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Barkley software distribution. Basically, when Unix came out, um, they made it free, which meant that uh, universities got really excited because they could get an operating system for the very expensive computers without having to buy one from IBM or digital equipment. And one of the one of the universities that got excited about it was the University of California at Berkeley, Berkeley, uh, Berkeley, I think. So that was part of the Unix kernel. And that was created in the 70s, and it's still hanging about inside an, a Mac operating system. So we have that as part of the kernel, and then it adds in extra bits for whatever you're doing. You might be running Java stuff. Poco is just a different type of uh, application environment. QuickTime for video and audio. BSD for uh, interface. And that interface can be loaded on top of it. So we've got the Aqua interface, the Mac interface that we know. So there's some stuff held in the kernel, some stuff added in later. They've decided that I.O. belongs in the kernel, but specific video I.O. for a quick time belongs outside it because not everybody will use it. So it's again getting that balance between let's have general I.O. built in there because that will make it quicker. But let's have more specific ones go out. OK, Alan, good luck. Um, you can watch the end of the, the lecture later and ask me questions if you want, of course. Um, iOS has the same kind of idea. We've got a core operating system. We've got services. Media services are different, so they're built on separately. And so is Coco, which, as I said, is a, a, an app development. So if you're wanting to write an iOS program, you use the Coco development, and it's a, a version of C. Android, on the other hand, is um, available, and you can go and look at the Android um, operating system and see what it does. Again, based on Unix. And I say based on Unix because it says they're based on Linux, but Linux is based on Unix. So all of these things build onto each other in the same way as Unix begat BSD, begat Mac OS. Unix begat Linux, which begat Android. So the basic Android kernel provides those things there, power, process, sorry, process memory, device, and added in power because that was really important. Why was power management really important? Because it's for portable devices? Yeah. It's for a small device that you put in your pocket. You're not going to be plugging it into the wall and you need to make sure that, that battery lasts you at least till you get home at night, which uh, some phone developers seem to have forgotten, I have to say. Um, so I did in power management to that because it's a mobile device. And then it decided, well, how are we going to build applications for this? And that uses something called 
a Dalvik virtual machine. So you write a program in something called Java. And those of you who remember introduction to programming last year will remember that there's compilers which create one end program and there's interpreters that run it one, one line at a time. Well, Dalvik allows you to take the Java interpreted language and convert it to run it in what's essentially a virtual machine, this Dalvik virtual machine that can run that as an executable. So it all starts getting quite complicated. And you'll know if you try and write any Android programs, there's a whole bunch of kits. So we were talking earlier about the APIs and the sorts of things that you have to call. The same thing happens if you're writing an Android app. You might need access to the web. You might need access to pressing buttons. You might need access to the phone. You might need access to well, anything at all. So you end up with something like this. You get poor Android. So that's that's the phone itself. You get something called the Dalvik virtual machine, which runs this pretend machine that doesn't actually exist, but gives you the option of running it everywhere, which is why your applications, when you upgrade from Android 8 to 9 to 10 to 11, your applications keep running because it's still running on that virtual machine inside the core Android system. And it's a big change to change that virtual machine. And again, if you've tried to write programs for Android, you'll see that there's usually a choice and somebody can correct me, I think I'm right. You can point them at Android versions up to four and Android versions after four. And the reason for that is to change the virtual machine. And as I said, um, not all operating systems cope with the same workloads, do the same things. Some operating systems take that a step further. You don't have an operating system. You decide what is it this machine is going to be doing. So if you buy a big machine from IBM to run your accounting software, you might say, OK, well, I'm going to need access to my files. I'm going to need access to output to print stuff. I'm certainly not going to need a graphical user interface. I don't need any internet or any networking because it's all in one machine. So you pick and choose which parts of the operating system you want to have. You run a sysgen and that creates a version of the operating system that runs just for your workload. Hopefully making it even faster for you to do that. Once you have that, you need to get that started. And for all the operating systems that we have looked at, it runs in the same sort of way. You start the computer, it checks the hardware. Have I got a screen? Have I got a keyboard? Runs some initial boot code to do that. And to check that you have an operating system stored somewhere. Some of you might have seen it. If your operating system becomes corrupted, you'll get an error message saying can't find operating system on the hard disk. So it finds the operating system, loads that into memory, and then transfers control to the new operating system. Some go further, some allow you to choose which operating system you want to install. So you can start up a machine and say, well, I want to run Windows or I want to run Unix or I want to run, well, you choose. So there's all of these things available to you. Any questions? No. OK. If there's no questions, then what did I want to say? I wanted to say that following that, um, there is a tutorial on OneNote, and it's a very specific tutorial. Remember that your assessment is a group report that takes the general theories of operating systems, and that's what we've been talking about, different ways we can approach an operating system, 
how DOS does it differently to Windows, which does it differently to Mac, which does it differently to Android. Your group report is to take each of these theories and figure out how they work in a Linux operating system. OK, so you're going to have to go into the. The depths of here's why we chose this is the type of file system we have. This is the type of interface we have. And to do that, it's probably helpful to actually have used a Unix operating system. So if you haven't, we have a tutorial here. And it's basically two parts. One is something called virtual box. And in the same way as Android there had a virtual machine running in the Android operating system, you can install virtual box to run other operating systems in your operating system. Now the instructions I've given here are for Windows 10, because I assume that's what most people were on, but there are instructions for Windows 7, for Mac, or whatever you want. So you install, first of all, VirtualBox. That allows you to host other operating systems. And there are lots and lots of Linux operating systems, lots of different distributions. I don't mind which one you choose, but I have given you instructions here for installing Ubuntu, which is a, a popular Linux distribution. So there's links here as to how to install Ubuntu on VirtualBox on Windows 10. So if you're doing this report, you might want to have a, a Linux distribution to play with, and that's a way to do it. So Ryan's saying, so basically what we need to do is write about how operating systems work, correct, and talk about how it would work on a Linux OS, almost correct. It's talk about how it does work. So we were talking there about kernels and micro kernels and stackables and all that kind of stuff. What choice has your Linux system made and why? If it chose a micro kernel, why did it choose a micro kernel and what did that allow? If it chose a, a monolithic operating system, why did it do that? And what are the pros and cons? Any questions about that? No. So no questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording in that case. Nobody said they liked my fancy animation. It's very cool. Weeks that took me. I'm lying. <laughs>